Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for um, asking me to speak here today. Um, I'm going to do a whistle-stop tour of the common sec second-line treatments, a little bit about how they work, when do we use them, monitoring arrangements, and, and along the way, some of the challenges. And I'm, I probably will go through quite quickly because I want to leave time for uh, questions and maybe for comments from the floor, particularly from dermatology um, colleagues. So there are some important principles of all second line treatments. We will usually have national and locally agreed guidelines. And I remember um, a few years ago, Hel Helen gave me the title of a talk, which was, why can I not have this? And it was about explaining to um, the, uh, at the meeting about why we just think, oh, well, we'd like a biologic, because, you know, listen, it sounded really great, didn't it, this morning? It's a magic cure. But actually, why do we not give out bi biologics or put it in the drinking water? So we'll have nationally and locally agreed guidelines. You'll all be aware that we are a publicly funded national health service, and we are... are guided by um, NICE, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. So again, it's very difficult for us to prescribe outside of NICE guidelines, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. All of you, when you're going to have a second line treatment, will usually have some form of proper assessment, and you've heard a bit about DLQI and PARSI earlier, and I'm going to explain a bit more about that. We need to consent people, and you heard about the problems of adherence to treatment this morning and the fact that perhaps we don't give people enough information before we go that, through that consent process. Most of these treatments will require monitoring, and that will require a partnership between the patient and the clinician that is overseeing the care in terms of agreeing to those monitoring arrangements. And most of what I'm going to talk about will be overseen by a dermatologist, either in a specialist secondary care department or sometimes in a community intermediate care setting. First of all, what are we talking about? And I make, I make no apology that throughout this talk, I'm, I've done quite a few screen, screenshots from the Psoriasis Association website because I want to show you that actually there's an awful lot of information there for any of you that need to be signposted to useful information about these treatments. So what we mean is this is where you've had a good trial of topical treatments, creams and ointments, and they've stopped working or they're not working, or possibly more importantly, you're having to get prescriptions every week or a fortnight and you're needing to use too much of them. So that means we move in to what we call the second line treatments. And what we're talking about essentially is ultraviolet light, systemic or tablet treatments, and then the biologic treatments. And we did have some discussion this morning, didn't we, around why don't we move quicker to different parts and different treatments, and we'll cover some of that as we go along. So many of you in this room may have had ultraviolet light, and there's two types that we talk about, narrowband TL01 and PUVA therapy, PUVA being sorolin tablets with UVA. And we had an, uh, a nice guideline uh, some years ago now, which gave recommendations that phototherapy be offered to people with plaque or gut ache psoriasis that cannot be controlled with topical treatments uh, alone. We think it works as an anti-inflammatory, but the big thing to me is that this is a huge commitment for patients. And you've just heard from Catherine about the very significant psychological impact that there is of psoriasis. And if we then suggest that you come up to the hospital two or three times a week and take time out of work, and that draws attention again to the fact that you have something that makes you feel different. So it's two or three times weekly for six to 12 weeks. And then you're going to say to me, but what about skin cancer? You know, we're, we're hearing an awful lot about sunlight and skin cancer and sunbeds being bad for you. But what I must do is reassure you that actually our phototherapy technicians who are often dermatology specialist nurses uh, will carefully measure and supervise the dosage. And some of you may be aware that we have a cumulative lifetime dosage that you would not exceed. And that varies with different types of light treatment, but would not normally be more than 150 treatment. And I've already explained that PUVA involves taking tablets. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about these treatments because of a shortage of time. 
So, who's going to benefit? Well, it's a great, it is a really great treatment. If we have a young patient who's had a sore throat, a streptococcal sore throat, and they've got an acute widespread gut ache psoriasis, rapid access to um, narrowband TL01 phototherapy can be incredibly effective. But I think the bottom point is the people that, the people that need to, who are going to have phototherapy are actually people who have the time to, to do phototherapy. There is actually, though, some good evidence, I think it might have been some of Chris's work, that actually showed that attending for phototherapy and that interaction with somebody else uh, and the psychological support uh, provided by the technician or the nurse that you're working with can be advantageous. So actually going to the hospital three times a week can be incredibly supportive. You can also get support in the use of your topical treatments on your non-treatment days. So there are advantages, but there are significant drawbacks um, to the, the time commitment that is required. And the other thing is, if I see a patient who's got ex really significant scalp, nail, and flexural psoriasis, then it's not, it's not really going to be for them. This is for people who've got psoriasis on much of their exposed skin. We avoid it usually in people who have a history of skin cancer. And the other problem is that although it may well work, work well, there may be a problem of rapid relapse after stopping treatment. And I'd be interested to hear from um, nurses or doctors within the room about how quickly they would be prepared to give a second course of light. We often do not do it for 12 or 18 months. Okay, so that's phototherapy. Now we're moving on to the systemic treatments and what's commonly used. And these are going to be essentially tablet treatments until we move into the biologics. Um, and, and the commonest ones that we use are methotrexate, cyclosporine, and acetretin. Those are the commonest ones that we use by far in this country, so I'm going to concentrate on those. But we do also use aprimolast and uh, dimethyl fumarate, so I'm going to talk a bit about those. So acetretin, I was really interested to see Zenis's slides about efficacy, and actually... Um, I thought that acetretin was not quite as effective as what he showed. He showed it was pretty effective. This is a vitamin A derivative, and it's what we call a retinoid. And the single most important thing about um, acetretin and retinoids generally is that this is a teratogen. So if anybody becomes pregnant on this medication, the baby will be abnormal. And that effect initially was thought to last up to two years, but some people would argue up to three years now after stopping treatment. So it's only prescribed by dermatology specialists and is usually limited to dispense, being dispensed at the hospital as well. Um, and patient information, obviously, and counselling is very important. Going back to the fact that we have guidelines, so we have a guideline, I think this is quite old now and hasn't really up to, been updated, and I suspect that because it's because there's not a, an awful lot new to say about acetretin. I think this is a nice drug. I see Chris sitting there and he said at lunchtime again, I've heard him speak about how he's going to cure psoriasis, which is great, and I think it's some really good evidence that eventually we may get there, and I hope we will. But along the way, I think there are some of these drugs that we're gonna to have to carry on using. And I think this is a nice drug to use for men, but in particular for postmenopausal women. And it can be pretty effective, but any of you that might have taken it may have encountered this really very dry lips that you often get. And in fact, if you don't get dry lips, then we would be suspicious that perhaps you're not taking the medication. So you, you get dry lips, dry nose. And the other thing is that the palms and soles sometimes peel. And for women, there is sometimes a problem of hair loss. And this is an example of when I have not had enough time to explain it. And people come back and they haven't taken it because they're worried about their hair falling out. And it's about understanding that that's, you know, it's this risks and benefits, isn't it? And the shared decision with your patient about what is more important. Your psoriasis is dreadful. There's a risk you might, your hair might, you might lose a bit of hair. And it's about helping patients with the uh, balance of those risks and benefits. And it takes four to six weeks um, to have an effect. I like it because the monitoring is relatively straightforward. We do a baseline blood test of uh, fats and LFTs patients start, we check them again at four to six weeks and then every three months, and we can use it for uh, long term. It other, the other thing it does is it works really well with phototherapy. So if I've got a patient who's got really bad psoriasis, um, 
I, I will often suggest we do both together and it works really well. But it isn't effective in all patients. And I think the work that we're doing with the B-STOP is going to be really important, which is collecting information that will help us to personalize and identify those patients where acetretin might work, which is easy, relatively straightforward, and those people where we may need to give methotrexate or cyclosporin. And hopefully some of this B-STOP work will, will enable us to answer that question at the outset. Now, I put in there that we should, um, there's been a lot of discussion about another retinoid, which some of you may have read about in the newspapers and heard about, um, called isotretinoin, which is used for acne. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about depression and suicide in people taking isotretinoin for acne, which is another retinoid. Indeed, there's been some very, very large studies that have suggested actually that there is no link that in fact acne itself causes depression and suicide and the drug is probably not relevant. But because of the fact that acetretin sits within that group, we probably should be thinking about uh, people and their um, mental health and well-being. It is now, as we talk about choices and challenges, we're going to be thinking about drugs that affect the skin and the and the joints, aren't we? Because some of you will want something that just affects the skin and is relatively straightforward. Others of you can't get out of bed in the morning because your joints are so stiff, and that's the big focus. So your choice will vary. And uh, acetretin, in my experience, is not effective in psoriatic arthropathy. So if I'm choosing my cohort of patients for this drug, I'd be talking about postmenopausal women and men. And I would often have patients on it for a long time. And you can up and down the dose depending upon side effects. For example, if the lips are dry, the peeling's too much, but the psoriasis is better, you can drop it back and then put it back up again if you want as well. So um, I think it's quite a useful agent. You've heard a bit about methotrexate. Um, it's been around a very, very long time. And those of you us that have used it actually find it safe and effective. And we've got lots and lots of patients that are on this medication and it works well. This is, um, this is an immunosuppressant though. Um, so we know that there's a lot of inflammation going on in psoriasis. And so methotrexate not only reduces the rapidity which with the cells within the skin turn over, but it also reduces inflammation and is an immunosuppressant. So this is a once weekly treatment. It's essential that we give our patients lots of information. People, uh, there was a big fuss a few years ago because people were taking it daily instead of once a week because it wasn't adequately explained. And we had 2.5 milligram tablets and 10 milligram tablets. And the pharmacists within the room will know that there were some uh, life-threatening events where people would dispense the 10 milligram tablets and they'd previously taken the 2.5 and they took four times the dose. Um, so we've had lots of guidance around how to prevent that sort of issue happening. There's some debate about folic acid. There's evidence that folic acid might reduce some of the side effects. Quite a lot of people get side effects from taking methotrexate, and there's some evidence that folic acid can counter those if it's taken five milligrams on the other six days of the week. I worked with a colleague, Paul Maurice, who was a, you know, he was just like the methotrexate man to me. He was brilliant on methotrexate, used, used it so much. And he was a big believer that um, we gave people too much folic acid because actually it counteracted the benefit of the methotrexate. So he taught me that the first thing he would do if you had your methotrexate once a week and your folic acid six days out of seven, before he increased the methotrexate dosage, he would cut down the folic acid and then he would increase the methotrexate. So that's a, a little bit of nuances, but it was a useful tip for me. Needs a fair bit of monitoring at the beginning, but it's a brilliant choice if it works. Lots of people will be on it for years and years and years. Richard Warren, also from Manchester, uh, published this great guidance document, uh, 2016, which was incredibly helpful for all of us. And I think one of the things going back to choices and challenges here is that clearly this drug, we've already said acetretin can't be used in uh, women of childbearing age. And we've got another one here, methotrexate. 
you know, we need to think about this group of patients. And again, there may be people in the room may, that may, maybe want to give, uh, talk about actually their experience of which drugs are best used during pregnancy. And of course, you've also got the male partners of women uh, wishing to conceive. And I, for sure, I had a chap who was on methotrexate and uh, they wanted to have a baby. He came off his methotrexate, got the most horrendous flare of his psoriasis. He was thoroughly miserable. And we had great difficulties in trying to help him in terms of sorting out uh, his medication. So lots of blood tests at the beginning, and there's a whole list of screening baseline blood tests that the Richard Warren document talks about. But it's quite a useful document, because we just used to do a tick box exercise of lots of tests and chest x-rays and whatever. And we now tend to be much more personalized in the tests that we will do. Um, We'll often need to do some regular blood tests at the beginning. We used to do a test dose and then bring people back, but we do that much, much less these days. And you'll often, if the dose is monitored, then we might need to do a little bit more in the way of blood tests. Um, slow to take effect. So let's think about the patient who's in their 20s, who's getting married in a few weeks. This isn't your answer because it's gonna take a while to kick in. And it can be used uh, with other treatments. You heard a bit about its use with biologics, perhaps not being helpful. It's got a fair few interactions with other medications, which the pharmacists in the room will give lots of useful information about when the patient is started on treatment. So the liver debate, uh, in the uh, well, my early days of my career, I started in dermatology in 85. Uh, there was a concern about liver damage and cirrhosis with long-term methotrexate, and we were actually doing liver biopsies on patients, taking a piece of the liver after they'd had 1,500 milligrams of methotrexate to look for that. Uh, then my colleague, Paul Maurice, worked with a group of people, and they developed the P3MP blood test as an alternative, but increasingly, we're moving towards the use of uh, fibroscan or other measures of liver fibrosis. And I'm just not sure whether that, that link really is there. Uh, we used to be very strict about people not drinking any alcohol and methotrexate, but for sure, we're a little bit more flexible about that now. So this is going back to uh, the conversation about adherence uh, this morning. This is a long-term medication. There's an importance about a partnership and a shared decision about the need for regular blood tests. We usually would ask people to reduce the amount of uh, alcohol, and obviously we've got the issue around conception. So who's suitable for it? Well, it's used a lot in children, and the pediatric dermatologists that I work with really like methotrexate in children, both for psoriasis and for eczema. And as I've already said, it's a long-term solution, uh, and your dose can be modified according to response. But most importantly, the two drugs I've spoken to, uh, sorry, the acetretin that I spoke to you about was not effective for arthritis, but this is a great drug for arthritis. So if I see a patient who's got arthritis and they've got widespread psoriasis, uh, then this is great. Who sorts out the monitoring? Who sorts it all out? I tend to look at it this way. If the patients come to me, with widespread skin psoriasis that bothers them and they've got an inflammatory arthritis, I would be very happy to, to take on their methotrexate monitoring, which will be somewhat different from the monitoring that a patient has from the rheumatologist. We do things a bit differently from them. Uh, if actually the patient has got predominantly an inflammatory arthritis and a little bit of psoriasis, I would be more minded to leave the oversight of that methotrexate in the hands of my rheumatology colleague. So what about cyclosporin? Well, this is a really interesting drug, which again, so many changes since I started in dermatology. I can remember the first papers published on cyclosporin. Um, this was a drug that was used in transplant rejection to suppress transplant rejection, and it was noticed to help uh, psoriasis. And so it's been widely used in dermatology. Um, the most important side effect is uh, kidney function and blood pressure. And the other thing is that long-term usage inevitably leads to permanent uh, kidney damage. But short, sharp courses work really well, and this works quickly. So this is your young patient who's got a major life event that they want to look good for. This will work very quickly. Um, young, fit, healthy patients, it works really well. 
Um, but you do need to keep an eye on kidney function. Uh, the creatinine is what is used mostly. And if it goes 30% above baseline level, we would normally be reducing the dose. With regards to blood pressure, if the blood pressure goes up but can be treated quite reasonably, we would not discontinue it. We would ask for help from the primary care clinicians to manage the blood pressure. And this, again, doesn't really work for joints. So we've only really got methotrexate at the moment of those top three that is working uh, for joints. Guideline again, going back to the guidelines. So this is suitable for young patients, particularly when you need a rapid onset of treatment, if they're fit and well with normal blood pressure and kidney function. But you do have to tell them that it's not a long-term treatment option. And you can get onto a bit of a roller coaster because you make them better, you start to bring it down. After six or nine months, they get worse and they're very cross with you. So you have to kind of then talk about, well, if they're flaring, they want to carry on having their cyclosporin, uh, you have to say, no, you're going to get permanent damage for your kidneys if you carry on for too long. We need to think about another option, and you come down on the cyclosporin and start that other option. And you are, um, if this is an immunosuppressant, so it's really immunocompetent people that we would want. Okay, so those are the three commonest. And then recently, more recently, I think it was maybe, yes, this is 2016, we got a great addition, and I like your toolbox. Um, I need to put mine in the toolbox. Um, this was a great addition to our toolbox, which is a Primalast. Um, and this is a nice, we had a nice health technology appraisal that reviewed all of the evidence around a Primalast and we got some recommendations that it could be used for chronic plaque psoriasis. And this is what now, where we now move into why can't I have this medication? You can have a Primalast, but your disease, um, you, you, you have to have not responded to other systemic therapies. Uh, such as cyclosporine, methotrexate, PUVA, et cetera, or when they're contraindicated. So in other words, if you can't have those treatments or if they haven't worked, you can then move on and be offered a Primalast. And in addition to that, you have to have a, a PARSI score, psoriasis area severity index score of 10 or more, and a dermatology life quality index of more than 10. So, what do we mean by these? You've heard DLQI mentioned a little bit, so I thought I'd just remind you, because many of you will be asked to complete a DLQI. Um, the Dermatology Life Quality Index was developed by Andrew Finley's team at Cardiff. There are a range of different tools. The one that you're most likely to encounter will be the DLQI. You can access this actually online, and it's in so many different languages. At um, Hatfield, I teach students from all over the world, and they say, oh no, we don't use that. And there's no excuse for them to not use it because it's available online in Arabic, in you know, Urdu, all sorts of different languages. And we can use it on all of our patients uh, in this country. It's a well-validated tool, and it's incredibly supportive. Counting how much psoriasis you've got, you've just, you've just heard from Catherine, how many patches of psoriasis have you got? It's not helpful to me. What I need to know is the impact it's having on you and your life. So we need two tools. We need the PARSI, which measures how much you've got, and we need the DLQI that measures what is the impact. Because for example, if you've got hands and feet affected only, that's a very small area, but can have a major, major impact on quality of life. So we use the DLQI and the PARSI in order to assist our, our consultation to review whether treatment is working. And it's also used in clinical trials as you saw this morning. But most importantly, for many of the NICE approved treatments, it's necessary um, as a baseline. Uh, I know that there's quite a lot of people now, I know at the free, I think that they've got it on an iPad, so people, before they go in at the psoriasis clinic, it may be the case in Manchester as well, they just fill in the, uh, on the iPad the DLQI whilst they're waiting uh, for the clinic. It doesn't take long, um, and you score each question, and the higher the score, the more quality of life is impaired, and over 10, uh, correlates well with a severe impact. And then we can use it to measure whether our treatments are working. So a reduction by five or more suggests a good response. And many of you may have filled this in. If you haven't, there's a few smiles, nice smiles around the room. Some of you have seen this many, many times and filled it in. 
I think the font needs to change. It looks a bit dated now, doesn't it? I'm sure it could be uh, tidied up. Uh, and those are the ten, 10 questions. And it's within the last two weeks uh, that, that this is relevant. So PARSI is the psoriasis area and severity index, and this is the tool that is used to assess clinical severity. So we measure what body, and our nurses are very, very good at doing this. They measure the body surface that is affected, and then the severity of individual lesions based on how red they are, how scaly they are, and how thick they are. And you will get a PARSI score. And this is an old fashioned example. I think most nurses now use an app and enter it onto an app and come up with the score, and you've got a PARSI score of 13 there. So going back to our Aprimalast, we needed a PARSI and a DLQI of greater than 10, and we can use it for moderate psoriasis, but it also works for arthritis. Not as well maybe as methotrexate, but there is evidence that it does work for arthritis. And the other thing is, I think there have been quite a few case reports suggesting that it works for nail psoriasis as well, whereas many of the other treatments will not be effective for nail uh, psoriasis. Um, side effects are often gastrointestinal. Many of those will settle with time if you stick with it. Um, and the real bonus for this drug is that very little drug monitoring is required. It's not an immunosuppressant, it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, so it's working in a different way. I didn't really think we should ha always have that man cartoon with a white coat and a stethoscope around his neck. I thought we needed a woman. The other thing is that you can't get pictures of doctors without stethoscopes, and no dermatologist has a stethoscope around their neck anymore. We have a dermatoscope uh, in front of us. So we need to get some cartoons sorted. So who's suitable for a primalas? So it will be psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, perhaps nails, uh, where you want an anti-inflammatory rather than immune suppression. And if you don't want to have to do too much in the way of monitoring, and you can take that long term as well. So what about uh, fumaric acid esters or dimethyl fumarate? I've got very little experience. Helen Young has left. She's a great fan of these. Uh, they were used in Germany for many years, anti-inflammatories. Um, the only patients I've used them on have had serious side effects, facial redness and diarrhea. Um, but, you know, lots of people have got good experience of this. You need to gradually increase the dose, um, uh, but it takes a few weeks to have an effect and similar monitoring. So um, usually dimethyl fumarate would be given where acetretin, methotrexate, cyclosporin are unsuitable or ineffective. And just finally, a few words about biologic treatments, but you've already heard a lot about them. But the big thing about biologics in this country is that they are reserved uh, for people with severe psoriasis who have not responded to systemic treatments such as PUVA, methotrexate, cyclosporine, and acetretin. So you, it is second line after all of those. Um, PARSI and DLQI needs to be greater than 10. Uh, lots of regular monitoring, and you've already heard we've got this phenomenal bad beer register. Everybody that has a biologic in this country is entered onto the register so that we can collect all of the necessary long-term information about safety and get some of that really rich data that you saw presented uh, this morning in some of those studies. Um, nice, as got had to say, obviously, in uh, prescribing biologics because of the costs. And uh, there's a, we've got great documents around baseline screening tests. So just to, to finish really on uh, what, what I want to say is that which one do I recommend? So phototherapy, people have time. Acetretin, uh, postmenopausal men and women. Methotrexate, long-term use and monitoring. Cyclosporin is the wedding drug, you know, short, sharp burst. Um, and the others that primalast and dimethyl Primalast is a, avoids immunosuppression and doesn't need much monitoring. And biologics are down, down there, uh, lower down after everything else has failed. So um, hopefully the B-STOP data will give us more information. It'll give us genetic markers that might tell us whether methotrexate will work, whether cyclosporin will work. And that's what we're hoping for uh, in the end. Uh, and I'll finish, and I've gone way, I thought I'd be much quicker that. I apologize, but hopefully we can have a few questions.
Nick, can I just ask Manusha, who's one of our new trustees, who's a consultant dermatologist in Leicester, do you want to comment on anything that I've said? Because you, you run a, a specialist psoriasis service. I really wanted to bring you in. Th thank you, Julia. Um, thank you for a whistle-stop tour on all the systemics. I just wanted to add that there is another new kid on the block, which is Ducravacitinib. Um, which, uh, again, you have to have um, severe psoriasis, uh, so PASI over 10, DLQI over 10. Um, I haven't had any personal experience using it, but there is another small molecule um, medication that can be taken by mouth, similar to Primalast, dare I say. Um, so it's, I, I, my practice is very similar to yours, so it's really important to map out um, patient and treatment journey and I think really just speaking to your patients uh, with regards to um, really what they want to achieve from their treatment. Um, we were talking over lunch that, uh, whereby you know I think um, we're getting to a point where clinical effectiveness of biosimilars, their safety and cost effectiveness um, really now means that we need to have conversations with NICE um, so that we can review our, um, our use of biologics earlier in patients so they can get, um, you know, th their quality of life earlier in life. Um, I think I can see some patients, uh, some people nodding. <laughs> uh, I really think we are there now um, because some of the sy systemic agents, um, which may be your second drug of choice. So say, for example, if someone's had methotrexate and if, you, if you're going down the route of, say, acetretin, for example, may be more expensive than a biosimilar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have data available on maintaining, quote unquote, remission after discontinuation of treatment? and particularly where biologics are concerned for the potential for immunogenicity? I think that's a really, really important question because it brings me back to what we will often say to patients, which is we can clear you, but at the moment we can't cure you. So many of these treatments will be suppressing the disease for a prolonged period of time. There are data on some patients who, for example, have phototherapy and they will go into a period of prolonged remission. But this is a condition that is re relapsing and remitting. And indeed, there was some data some years ago that suggested about, for about 30% of patients, if you did nothing, the psoriasis might get better over time without any intervention. So this is a relapsing and remitting condition. And I think that's the other reason it's very difficult to evaluate whether or not the treatments are leading to that remission or whether the remission might have occurred anyway, spontaneously. It's very difficult to get that data. There are data from the biologics, but I don't do biologics. Chris, what's the data from the biologics about inducing remission? I've got a microphone. Um, thank, it's a very good question, actually. So there is data using um, anti io 23 biologics, risankizumab is the original data, where some patients, if they treat them early enough in the disease course, and I think that's the crucial thing, we often go get to treat, use these great treatments until the disease has been running for quite a long time. <clears throat> but treating early on, there are some patients, and we can't predict who at the moment, will go into long-term remission with just a single injection, and that was the original studies. But there's now been work done with um, one of the other biologics, a similar class called gazolcumab, and again, it's that treating them within two years of disease onset, much better chance of getting a very long-term remission. And um, so that's a promising. So, you know, treating early, using, trying to get biologics early. So what you were saying earlier on about, you know, now with the, with the cost effectiveness of biosimilars, you could start to make a case to NICE that, look, we've got lots of, a long track record now of understanding the safety of anti-TNF biosimilars, and maybe we should be thinking seriously about bringing these in earlier on in the, in the disease course. Yeah. I mean, what we were talking about at lunchtime is that for eczema, 
Um, there is dupilumab, which has transformed the treatment of childhood eczema, but NICE only requires failure on one systemic treatment, whereas we are a bit back in the dark ages now because we are requiring failure or contraindication to a lot more. So I think Manusha raised this with me at lunchtime, and I think it's something we need to take forward with my, NICE because the cost effectiveness of the biosimilars means that we, we could be just saying fail on one and move on. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. What comes to my mind is if psoriasis frequently has a psychological stroke trauma cause, should this be treated as a priority before the drugs? Well, so uh, we, I think the association and the dermatologists in this room would completely agree with you. And certainly um, we were having this conversation uh, last night. The psychological support and input is absolutely pivotal, but we just don't have the resource. And I don't understand. I think we need to keep pushing, but you're absolutely right. We need to run that in parallel with everything that we do, don't we? And the exercise, you know, there's a much bigger picture to managing the holistic view of patients uh, rather than just giving drugs. You're absolutely right. It's part of the package, but unfortunately, there are not many. I mean, even Catherine is working in cystic fibrosis, not in psoriasis. Um, and I think what you're hoping is that your book and your strategies within that, which we can, of course, publicise, will help people to do things themselves. There is no doubt. You don't necessarily need a trained clinical psychologist to do a lot of the stuff that Catherine's talking about. Um, but we need to signpost patients and explain that that is as important as their medication. Thank you. Sorry, I've overrun.